finishing lawn vol. Let's pick up on page 193 or about line 205. We're going to finish lawn vol and then hopefully start some of um, <coughs> Sir Gowan and the Green Knight. Okay. So what have we seen? Lawn vol goes off because, you know, life's pretty bad for him. He goes off. He doesn't quite fall asleep, but he goes to fall asleep in the meadow. And these beautiful maidens come, and they take him to the fairy princess, who's the queen of fairyland. She's the queen of elves, all right? And she gives him her body and her soul with the provision that he not tell anybody. As long as he keeps their love secret, he'll be happy for the rest of his life. He goes back to town, he finds out his men are all now dressed much, much nicer than they were before. And he essentially has a party that night, and the table just flows with food and drink. And no one knew where he got this from, we're told. There was no knight in the town who greatly needed, a sus who su who greatly needed sustenance, whom Lonval does not have brought to him, and well and richly served. Now, keep in mind, at the opening of the poem, how did Arthur and all the other knights treat Lonval? They shunned him. He was an outcast. Okay, What were we told about Lonval just before that passage? That is, before we were told that he was shunned and an outcast. He was generous. And then we find out he's now poor. Well, why is he poor? Because he was so generous. He gave everything away. All right? So now... When other knights who are poor, who are down on their luck, so to speak, come to him, he gives freely. Notice the difference? Okay. Lonval gave rich gifts. He ransomed prisoners. He clothed minstrels. He did great honor. There was no stranger or dear friend to whom Lonval did not give. All right. He had great joy and pleasure. He can see his beloved often, whether by day or by night. She's entirely at his command. She's kind of like, if you're familiar with the old TV show from the 60s, I Dream of Jeannie. You know? He snaps his fingers and Barbara Eden arrives, as it were. Okay? Then we're told that same year, notice we're not given any year. We're not told an exact time frame. We're just told in that same year. All right? Thirty knights go out to enjoy themselves in the garden below the tower where the queen was staying. So what does that mean? They go out to enjoy themselves in the garden below the tower where the queen is staying. Louder? Drinking could be. Okay, they're a bunch of knights. Probably means one thing. They're high on testosterone. If the tower is where the queen is staying, is the queen going to be by herself? No. 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 Who's going to be with her? Her attendants, her ladies in waiting. So you have a bunch of testosterone high knights. What doing what? Down in this garden. Okay. Just showing off. They're trying to get the attention of the ladies. And we're told Sir Gowan was with them, that is with, with the knights. And his cousin, the handsome Evain, Gowan, the noble, the valiant, we'll hear more about Sir Gowan in a few minutes, who made himself so beloved by everyone, said, by God, my lords, we've done wrong. Why? Because we didn't bring Lonval with us. Here, Lonval is giving everything he had is to everybody, and they don't invite him out to play in the garden. Okay. So they go back at once, they go to his lodging, and they persuade Lonval to accompany them. Okay, so, so get this in mind. These 30 knights are out there, and they realize, oh, Lonval isn't with us. Let's go get him. They will get Lonval, they bring him back. And the queen, we're told, is what? Leaning on a window ledge. She had three ladies with her. She saw the king's household. She saw Lonval and noticed him. Okay? that noticed him is she took regard of him. She kind of went, oh, 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 who is that? Like she sees him for the first time. So she calls one of her ladies, 
she sends for her maidens, that they're going to go themselves with her where the men are in the orchard. They're going to go do what? Enjoy themselves where the men are in the orchard. So the men's idea has worked. They've gotten their attention. So now the ladies are going to come down. I remember the whole courtly love, adulterous, we talked about the other day. So she takes 30 or more of them with her, and they go down by the stairs. Well, golly, that's a, that's a big herd of women. How many knights are there? 30 or more, because there were 30 before. So now there's at least 31. And how many women are there? Well, there's at least 31. Right? So they go down, and the knights are see them. They take the ladies by the hand. The conversation was not unrefined. So what does that mean? It was not unrefined. It was very refined. In other words, these knights aren't speaking gutter language <coughs> to the women. All right? This isn't a word talk, in other words. Okay? Lonval wanders off by himself. So there's 30 knights and 30 women, and Lon Ball's over here, you know, picking flowers, <laughs> and the queen's sitting here twiddling her ears. It seems long to him until he might have his beloved kiss, embrace, and touch her. He values little another's joy if he does not have them. In other words, being with all the other knights and ladies, it's no fun. No. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, when you can have the queen marries with you. So the queen sees him alone and she goes off to him. She showed him all her feelings. She's pretty blatant. And one thing you need to understand about Guinevere in medieval literature, she's not shy. She's not a, a will violent by any means. What Guinevere wants, Guinevere gets. Okay. She goes right to him, she sits by him, she spoke to him, she shows all her and she says, Lonval, I have honored you greatly. She says, I've honored you greatly. Loved you and held you very dear. You can have all my love. This is kind of like the queen coming up and saying, Oh, Lonval, you are so lucky because you may have me. Just looking down her nose at him. You can have all my love. Tell me your desire. I am willing to be your lover. But she's condescending to him. You should be delighted with me. How you are that I chose you. Lady, let me be. I have no interest in loving you. He just violated. One of the rules of courtly... Oh, and I forgot to bring that sheet. One of the rules of courtly love... Okay... One of the rules of chivalry, and one of the main tenets, tenets, not tenets, if you ever use that word, like, you know, the tenets of Christianity, it's tenets. I always get people writing the tenets. These are like people who live within Christianity, right? One of the main tenets of courtesy is what? To always be respectful. Meant for to women. Okay? When he says, I have interest in loving you, he violates this. In the courtly love tradition, it was permissible to deny a woman. But you have to do it in such a way that she doesn't know she's being denied. Yeah. Come on, guys, you can understand this. This is like the, all the laws of dealing with women. They're always right, you're always wrong. Just, you know, admit it, okay? You can deny them, but they have to not realize they're being denied or rejected. Look what he does. I have no interest in loving you. Ew. I mean, he's essentially telling her, Ew. <laughs> For a long time, I have seen king. He gives an explanation for why he's denying her. I don't want to betray my faith to him. He's a good and loyal knight. See, 
in the courtly left tradition, it wasn't required, not all knights were required to find a married woman that they could fall in love with. Okay? It wasn't a requirement for a knight. It just often happened that way. You or for your love shall I wrong my lord. So she could take that and say, well said, sir knight. She doesn't. Why? Because she's Guinevere. <laughs> And she's an itch <laughs> with a B on the front. <laughs> oh, Guinevere is portrayed in medieval literature. She's really bitchy. Okay? So what does she say? She takes what he has said and watch what she does with it. Lanval, it's quite clear to me you have no interest in that pleasure. People have often told me you're not interested in women. <laughs> you have shapely young men and take your pleasure with them. Okay. I'm trying to... S um, she says that she uses for men is there on... Uh, I'm pretty sure this is it. My French is really rusty. Line 281, it's that word, valet. It's related to our word, a valet, guy who parks your car. Well, what else does a valet do? He's like a butler, okay? Shapely young men, however, does not necessarily refer to like a 20-year-old young man. A valet was often a young boy, like preteen. Okay? So what she says is even worse than just accusing him, for example, of homosexuality. She's saying, no, you're a pederast. You like little boys. Okay? Base villain is that word in French. Infamous wretch, my lord is very badly repaid for allowing you to remain in his presence. I believe that he will lose God by it. That is, she's saying, Arthur is going to lose God's support because of you being part of his kingdom. So what does Lonval do? He's quite distressed when he hears all this. But he's not slow to respond. Out of anger, he said something that he would often regret. Okay? Out of anger. He doesn't curb his tongue. He doesn't wait. He doesn't go cool off and then send the email. No. What does he do? I know nothing about that line of work. In other words, how dare you accuse me of that? But I love and am loved by one who should be valued more highly than all the women I know. Yeah, big uh-oh. He hasn't yet given her up, so to speak, but he's going to. And I'll tell you one thing, know it well and openly. This is where he goes too far. He could have stopped right there. I am loved by and love one well, okay, who should be valued more highly than all the women I know. Pretty much any courtly lover ought to say that. To any woman who comes up and tries to seduce me. No, no, no. I can't love you because the one I love is the one I prize more highly than all other women. Okay? It's what any man in love with a woman ought to say when anybody else seduces him or tries to. But he doesn't stop because what does he say? Okay? I'll tell you one thing, know it well and openly. Any one of her servants, even the poorest maid, is worth more than you. Lady, queen, <laughs> in body, face, and beauty, in manners, and goodness. Okay? Even the poorest maid. What does that mean? Remember the, the drawing I did the other day on the houses where the roof overhangs the next roof? Okay. Chambermaids. What was a chambermaid's duty? To empty the chamber pots, to make the beds, 
He is saying even her chambermaid is worth more than you in body, face, beauty, manners, and goodness. Her, her scullery maid, the kitchen girl, is better looking than you, has a better body than you, is more beautiful than you, has better manners than you, and is more morally good than you. Now, when he says all that, he crosses every line there is in the universe, okay, in terms of the courtly tradition. So what does she do? She leaves at once and she, she's crying. She goes to her chamber and she's crying. Why is she crying? He hurt her feelings. She's starting it. <laughs> she's kind of like, if you're familiar with Princess Bride, almost the greatest film of all time. She's like when Wesley is lying in the bed at the end and he insults Humperdinck and Humperdinck says, I believe that's the first time anyone has ever dared insult because he calls him a warthog face and all this kind of stuff. That's the queen. No one has ever said anything like this to her. Okay? So she goes to her bed and she's sick. Never, she said, would she get up if the king did not do the right thing and the complaint she would make to him. So the king returns from the woods because it's just convenient he's been out hunting or something. He'd had a good day, notice, until he gets home. And then his wife. <laughs> you know. And so she makes her appeal. My wife and I have been married 28 years. It's a good marriage. She falls at his feet. She asks for mercy. She says that Lonval has shamed her. And notice what she says. Yeah. <gasps> How? Okay. This is probably, not necessarily, but I think probably, a parallel of something we see in the Bible. Bingo. Potiphar and Potiphar's wife. It's not Potiphar per se. It's Joseph and Potiphar's wife. You know, Joseph goes off to Egypt, you know, DreamWorks or SGK, whatever. The, Joseph, King of Dreams, whatever the movie is. He goes off to Egypt. And what happens? He gets raised to a position of power in Potiphar's household. Potiphar's wife says, man, that's one good-looking Jew. She tries to rape him. He runs off. She pulls her cloak. She keeps his cloak. Okay, because when he escapes, she pulls his clothes off. All right? When her husband comes in, she says, he tried to rape me. He gets thrown in jail for a long time, the dreams and all that kind of stuff. All right? He boasted of such a beloved, who one who is so elegant, noble, and proud, that her chambermaid, the poorest girl who served her, was worth more than the queen. And so the king gets angry, because, I mean, after all, the king should have the most beautiful woman as queen. He's upset that one of his knights would offend his wife. So, he swore that Lonval would have to defend himself in court, and that if he couldn't, he would be burned or hanged. So how's he going to defend himself in court? What do you have to do? Yeah, you have to have evidence. He can't say, uh, if it please the court, I'd like to present, you know, uh, defense witness one. And nobody's there. He doesn't have a Polaroid of her. <laughs> can't pull out his cell phone. <laughs> So the king goes out, he calls three of his nobles, they send for Lonval, who's already had sorrow and trouble enough, because he went back to his lodging, and what does he realize? Damn. Yeah, I gave her up. So she gave me up. <laughs> I was supposed to keep it secret, and I didn't. I'll never see her again. So where is he then? He's back to the beginning of the poem. He doesn't have all the wealth and treasure anymore. And he doesn't have his beautiful lover's body or soul anymore. He calls on her again and again and again. And she doesn't come. A hundred times he begs her to have pity. Nope. 
not going to happen. Okay? Alas, what will he do, our poet tells us. So the three men arrive. They tell him he's got to go to the court, that the queen had accused him, and he goes in great sorrow. Notice, they could have killed him for all he cared. His sorrow isn't that he has to answer to Arthur. His sorrow is that he'll never see his lover again. They could have killed him for all he cared. This is Longval's way of saying, go ahead, because life is meaningless now. So he comes before the king. He was sorrowful. He was silent. The king says, you've done me a great wrong. You began to base a suit, blah, 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 blah. You boasted foolishly. And we're back in the Anglo-Saxon period where we're repeatedly told, never issue a boast that you cannot fulfill or that you cannot redeem. Okay? Your beloved is far too exhausted when her maid is more beautiful and worthy than the queen. He denies the dishonor and shame of his lord, word by word, just as he said it. In other words, he says, uh -uh. let me tell you the full story. She was the one who came to me. She was the one who offered me her body. I said no, because I serve you. But he does acknowledge, yeah, I did say that about my lover. And about her lowest serving maid. Because it's true. Notice he doesn't backtrack at all. Okay. So he says, let the court deem its judgment. Let it do what it will. So the king sends for his men. Why? Notice Arthur doesn't pronounce judgment himself. He sends for the court, the round table, to determine how should we deal with this. They all went off together, judge, and decided that Longball should have his day in court. But he must provide guarantees that he will await his judgment and return to his presence. In other words, he gets bail. They're not going to lock him up. But no one in the household were there, we're told, who would be willing to stand what's called surety for him. That is, who would let whatever judgment that is to fall on Lonval fall on themselves should Lonval skip him until Sir Gowan steps forward. Gowan goes to act as a guarantor for Lonval and all his companions after him. So the king says, okay, I'm going to hold you guys to this. And not only you, but your lands and fiefs, each one for himself, will be in the balance if Lonval skips. All right? So Lonval goes off to his lodging, and knights go with him. Why do you think knights go with him? You had to make sure he doesn't skip down, and they lose all their wealth. Okay? They rebuke him. They counsel him. They curse him for such mad love. Every day they go to see him. They want to make sure that he's eating and drinking because after all, you have to be good and healthy so that you can be publicly executed. <laughs> okay? And so they have the date that they had determined the court would. And we're told, line 420, I believe that there were some hundred there who would have done anything in their power to free him without a trial. He was very wrongly accused. What's that telling us about the knights? What do they know? Yeah, they know how Guinevere is. Okay? They know how she behaves. And let me put it this way, how Guinevere behaves. I'll try and put it delicately. If it moves, she'll sleep. That's, that's pretty much how Guinevere is in much medieval literature. If it moves, she'll jump it. Okay? Now, I'm not saying go out into bestiality and all that. I mean, if it's human, it moves. Let's put it that way. Right. So this is why they understand. And I'm going to tell you a, a brief version of another Lonval story when we finish this one to give you an idea of, of that notion. 
So they go and sit in judgment. So you now have everybody sitting around this round table. And the king speaks and says, you know why you're all here. We're here to render judgment. Lonvol has to prove that what he said is true. And Guinevere's sitting there all smug and mighty, thinking there's no way. And he's going to die. Right. So, line 449. Lonval can affirm this by oath, and the king will turn him over to us for justice. His guarantor. That is, if his lady should come forward. Well, what has Lonval probably already told him? She won't show up. She's already said, I'll never see you again if you don't keep our love secret. But if he can't produce proof, service to the king and must take his leave of him. Ah, so they've modified it a little bit. He won't be publicly executed. He'll be exiled. Well, if you remember Anglo-Saxon period, exile mean? Yeah, you might as well be dead. Because he can't go back to father. Keep in mind, his father is a king in a foreign land. What would it look like to go back to your father having been exiled? Utter failure. Who does that reflect on? Daddy. So, tell your beloved to come and bear witness. He says, I can't. So they go back to the judges. And we're told, 471, judges make their ruling. They saw two maidens coming on two beautiful, brisk palfreys. They were extremely lovely. They were dressed in perfect taffeta, like they're going to the prom down to their bare skin. Everyone gazed at them eagerly. Gowan and three knights with him went to Lonval to put him the two maidens. He was very happy. Begged him to say whether this was his beloved. That is, Sir Gowan was very happy. And asked, Notice what Sir Gowan's comment means. How beautiful are these two maidens? They're more beautiful than I almost said Galadriel. More beautiful than Guinevere. More beautiful than Guinevere. Londol says, nope, don't know who they are, where they come from, or where they are going. Liar, liar, pants on fire. <laughs> he doesn't necessarily know who they are, but do you really think he doesn't know where they're coming from? So the maiden's going along. And... Where do they go to? They go to the king. What does it mean they go to the king? We're now in Arthur's hall. The king's table. Do the women come to the hall and dismount the horses outside the hall? Right up to the king's table, to the dais. They got down in front of the dais where King Arthur was sitting. The horse is his food, essentially, and they dismount. King, make your chambers ready and spread out silks, where my lady can step if she wants to take lodging with you. Woo! Who does she think he, she is? Spread out silks, why? Sounds too low for her. She, she doesn't deign to touch the bare <laughs> stone paved floor like Guinevere does. Would it be more than horses to go? Would it be dirty on the floor? That would make sense to uh, No, normally you wouldn't ride your horse into the hall where the king is sitting. I'm just thinking Knight's Tower. Yeah, so that's yeah. So it's not supposed to. No. <laughs> yeah, that's not supposed to happen. Especially that church, because if I remember right, that's Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't do that. So, he says, okay, <laughs> grants this to them, calls two knights, they get led up to the chambers. And so the king asks his nobles, come on guys, I'm waiting, what's your judgment? And the nobles, the other knights are like, did you not just see these two 
gorgeous women. Uh, we broke off our discussion on account of the ladies that we saw. We, we've not made a decision. Well, continue talking. Okay. So they put their heads together in a huddle and they're talking. And two more maidens down the road, dressed in cool silks, riding two Spanish mules. The vassals were delighted by this. They say to each other, oh, now Lonvo is cured. In other words, whoever the vassals are, which probably refers to them, they look at these two women, and either one of them is more beautiful than Guinevere. And Yvain goes to him and says, Rejoice, for the love of God, speak to us. Here come two maidens, very elegant and beautiful. Surely it is your beloved. Kind of looks up out the window. No, nope, not her. And the maids arrive, just mount before the king. Many people greatly praised. No, it's praised first. Their bodies. I mean, these are swimsuit models. Okay, faces and coloring were certainly worth more than the queen ever was. The elder was courteous and wise. She spoke her message because make ready rooms for us to receive my lady. She's coming here to speak to you. He says, okay, take him where the others are, like lock the room almost. Okay. And so he orders the nobles again. Judgment. What are we going to do with Lonval? They, uh, we're, sorry, we're all befuddled. The guys are standing there and their jaws have dropped open they're just like because these women are so gorgeous and the queen meanwhile what is getting angry that they were keep kept waiting so long by them I think there's a little bit more there why else is she getting angry <laughs> for beautiful women in her house does that mean none of the other women in the house are beautiful does she have all ugly maidens around her to make herself feel more beautiful <laughs> it's be a little charitable. No, they're not all ugly, you know. But yeah, she's not stupid enough to go. Well, what's going on? <laughs> she kind of sees how this day is going to progress. Okay, when through the town comes a maid riding a horse. There is no lady in the world more beautiful. And this could be an illusion to the story of Lady Godiva. Everybody know that story? It has nothing to do with Godiva chocolate, by the way. She just gives her name to the chocolate. Uh, lady Godiva, if I remember correctly, which I don't. <laughs> The only part I remember is she rides through the town naked. Oh, that's right. She rides through the town naked. The king, she makes this agreement with the king so that the king will stop taxing the people so heavily. Okay? She and her husband are rich. And she loves the people, the commoners, the low folk. <coughs> and she says, you know, if you will stop taxing them, taxing them I will ride the town naked. And the queen's like, yeah, I'll like to see that. Okay, deal. Okay, so she rides through town on horseback, and the people are so moved by her humility, they close the windows, close the doors, so nobody sees her. She was actually based on, do you remember the name of the Anglo Saxon princess? She, she's based on whether or not. This actually happened, okay, is not quite known, but she is a real person. She's riding a white paw, white purity, okay, which carried her well and gently. Had it, this is the palfrey, not her, had a well and head, no more beautiful animal under heaven. Palfrey was richly harnessed, no counter king under heaven could have afforded it all without selling or mortgaging the land. So, the horse has hugely expensive trappings, right? She's dressed this way. 
in a shift of white linen, which let both her sides be seen. I mean, she'd be perfect red carpet at the Oscars, okay? Because the shift is essentially just like a long piece of cloth with a hole cut in it for the head that comes down over her front and goes down over her back and it completely exposes both sides. We're not told that it's tied, okay? As it was, well, we are. It's laced on either side, but I kind of imagine these are wide laces. So a lot of skin show. Yeah. Okay. She had a lovely body. A long, a long, I almost said a long nose. Waist. <laughs> I don't really know what that means. You know, lovely body. You know, hourglass figure, you know, like that. But long waist. That's kind of weird. She's <laughs> long Probably willowy. We'll be charitable. Rather than say she's deformed. Uh, long waist, a neck, neck whiter than snow on a branch, gray-green eyes and a white skin, beautiful mouth, well-formed nose, dark eyebrows, and a lovely forehead. Curling golden hair. No golden thread cast such a gleam as did her hair in the sun. Her hair is golder than gold. Right? So at this point, you know, the guys are on the ground <laughs> worshiping her. Her mantle was dark purple. Royalty. Royalty. Okay. She'd wrapped its ends around her. She holds a falcon on her fist. Why? Royalty. Okay. Falconry is a sport of kings. That's what it's called. Or queens. Okay. And a greyhound around her. All of this royal imagery. So they know... This isn't the scullery maid, right? Greyhound runs behind her. There's no one in the town, great or small, not the old men or the children who did not go to look at her. No joke. She comes along. The judges saw her, considered a marvel. Those who loved the knight came to him and they said, you're free. <laughs> the maiden was coming. Who, if it pleased God, would set him free? Here comes one who is not tawny nor dark. Tanned. Nor dark. She is the loveliest in the world of all the women who live. He lifts her. He sees her. The blood rises to his face. In other words, he blushes. He's like, oh baby, you came back for me. Very quick to speak, and he says, It is my beloved. Now I care little who may kill me if she does not take pity on me. The lady enters the palace. Such a beauty had never come there. She dismounts before the king so that she was quite visible to all. And I think that, you know, allows for interpretation. She's got this tunic or shift laced up the sides, and she dismounts so that she can be seen by all. Not really quite sure what that means. If we get a R or X-rated image here, I do think it implies that she's seen. That is, a lot of her body is visible. She lets her mantle fall so that they could see her better. That is, the mantle that she was wearing, she just kind of lets fall on the carpet. The king, who was very well bred, up to meet her. Why? Because a gentleman rises from his chair when a woman enters the room. He didn't get up when the previous four came in. Okay. All the others honored her and offered themselves to her. I bet they did. <laughs> Please, let me be your vassal. <laughs> Even once a year, let me be your vassal. Get out of the way, Longval. You know. When they had looked at her well and great beauty, she spoke in this way. For she didn't wish to delay. In other words, she had pressing business. King, I have fallen in love with one of your vassals. You see him here. It's Lonval. Notice, I, what's the verb tense? Have fallen. What is have fallen? It began in the past and continues where? Till now. 
if it was had fallen, that means it began in the past and it ended in the past. Okay? Not necessarily it began and ended at the same moment. I have fallen in love with one of your vassals. You see him here. It's long ball. He was accused in your court. I do not wish it to be held against him concerning what he said. You should know that the queen was wrong. He never asked for her love. All right? So here we have an objective witness. She says the queen was wrong. And concerning the boast he made, if he can be acquitted by me, let your noble free. And so she kind of does this. Okay. What do you say? <laughs> it's up to you guys. Is his boast true or false? The king grants that it should be so, that they should judge rightly. There is not one who did not judge that Lonval was completely exonerated. The hundred or so that are there go free. <laughs> Imagine what Guinevere is doing at this point. Stewing. Steam is coming out of her ears. He is freed by their judgment. The maiden takes her leave. The king cannot detain her. She had enough people to serve her. Kind of implying that even the king wants to serve her. Or service her. <laughs> Outside the hall was set a great block of dark marble where heavy men mounted who were leaping in the court. Lonval gets up on it. The maiden comes to the gate. With one leap, Lonval jumps on the palfrey behind her, and they go off to Avalon, the Isle of the Elves, where Arthur currently, if you believe Arthurian mythology, where Arthur currently dwells, where he is receiving healing from the, stro from the stroke of Mordred, and when England has its greatest need, will return. Okay? We'll talk about that when we get to Mallory. We're, with her, he went to Avalon, so the Bretons tell us, to a very beautiful island. He was carried off there. No one ever heard word of him, and I can tell no more. <laughs> the end. Longval ends happily ever after for Longval. Arthur and Guinevere? <laughs> Probably going to have a rocky time for a little while after this. Okay? Now, real quickly, this other story of Longval is called. Sir Lonfall, L-A-U-N-F-A-L. It's the top. L-A-U-N, Sir Lonfall. This is by Thomas Lechester, which means Thomas of Chester, right? And in this one, I'll give you a real brief version. In this one, there's a magic drinking horn, right? Great big, like, Aurochs horn, right? Holds a gallon or so of good beer. And the climax of the story is you've had all the knights, you know, sitting talking about, you know, their lovers, their wives, you know, how they're faithful to them, blah, 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 blah. And so this horn gets a spell put, on, put upon it such that whoever boasts okay, that his lover is faithful to him and he drinks of that horn, if he's false, that is, if his lover is not faithful to him, the horn will spill. He won't be able to put it up to his mouth and drink it without stuff trickling down. Okay? It's the test of your spouse's fidelity. Because I could believe my spouse is totally faithful. No, that she's cheating on me. You have the horn of you know proof here, as it were. And so at the end of the poem, they're sitting around the round table. And like Cadman, the horn is making its way around. Okay? And it comes to guys, and a couple of them drink, you know, little drops come, and other you know, their spouse or their lover is not quite totally faithful, but you know, maybe a little cheating is okay. And then it comes to Arthur, and Arthur swears up and down. Guinevere is loyal and true and faithful and pure as the driven snow after it's been driven over by a hundred semis, you know, kind of thing. And he goes to take his drink. And he can't get any liquid in his mouth. I mean, he's got the thing. And it doesn't come in his mouth. It's coming all over his shirt and tunic. Okay. It's just another little bit of evidence that Guinevere... 
has kind of a soiled character, let's say, in uh, medieval literature. Okay, leave there and go to... Okay, go ahead. I don't know, because this was written probably during the reign of Henry II. Henry II reigned from 1154 to 89. Um, Magna Carta obviously is 1215. I think what's what's being suggested here is that you know what is at the heart of Arthur's kingdom, and because this is this is more. Anglo-Norman Arthurian, let's say. It's a Breton lay, so it's written in, in Breton. But it's more of an Anglo-Norman Arthurian story than a later English Arthurian story. Okay? And so what we get here of the image of Arthur is that what kind of king is Arthur? He's got the round table, which we talked about. It has no head. <coughs> in other words, Arthur is a good king because he wants there to be equality among all the knights, right? And so when he calls for a judgment of the court, this is showing that Arthur isn't a dictator. Now, that could be kind of leading up to what we see happen in Magna Carta, but it'd be really early for that. Another question? Um, the law in the part, is that what she was going to No. No, it's probably it's probably more like she's, you know, like Charlize Theron or Nicole Kidman. She's tall and well dimensioned, let's say. Yeah. So she's not pregnant, but she's wearing white even though she's you know, blonde. So why is she allowed to wear white? Who is she? <laughs> Queen of the Fairies. That's why. Because she's, she's, yeah, because she's outside the rest of our realm. And you could say, I think it could be argued, um, if you really wanted to get into the kind of the anthropological stuff, you know, that this is a quote-unquote common law marriage, let's say. That she is wearing white because she's chaste with Lonval. That is, you can be sexual and chaste, as long as you have one sexual partner, period. In which case, one could still have white on. But I think it's more because she's an elf, because she's a fairy, okay? and she's the queen of the fairies. Okay? All right, Sir Gallon and the Green Knight. We've got 15 minutes. <laughs> Sir Gallon and the Green Knight is not a Breton All right? Sir Gallon and the Green Knight was written during that period that I had up on the board the other day, the alliterative revival. Revival. So Gown of the Green Knight is preserved in, this is the manuscript, what do you call it? Cotton, Nero, A, 10. You already know how Sir Robert Bruce Cotton organized his library. He had the bookcases. On each of the bookcases, he had the head, or the bust, of a Roman emperor, right? Beowulf was under Vitellius. The manuscript that Sir Gown of the Green Knight it was in was under the bookcase that had Nero's bust on it. It was on the first shelf, and it was the tenth item in, right? This manuscript has four poems. Sir Gallon and the Green Knight, Pearl, Patience, and what is variously called purity or cleanliness. All right? These four poems, all by the same author, all written by the same person. That is, they're all in the same handwriting in the manuscript. Okay? Whoever this person was, because we don't know who it was, but when, when one refers to these poems, 
and you refer to the author of them, you either call the author the Gawain poet or the Pearl poet. One of those two. They never get called the Patience poet. <laughs> because very few people read these two poems. Patience and Purity. These are the two major poems. And these are two major poems of the Middle English period. Pearl is an allegorical poem. You know, in it a guy sees a vision of his young daughter who has died and she's on the other side of a river. The other side of the river, the river is Jordan, right? And it's a big allegory kind of on Christ's thing of the pearl of great price, right? So Gallon of the Green Knight is not allegorical. Well, I'll take that. Some people will say it's heavily allegorical, but you can read it without allegorizing it, right? Now, the alliterative revival, as I said the other day, is roughly this period, 1350 to 1375. We don't know when Sir was written. Okay? We do have one little clue Turn to the very end of the poem for a moment, which is on page 323. Okay. We have one little clue at the very end of the poem where you get this little motto. Oni swaki mali Okay, which means evil to him who evil thinks, okay? which is the motto of the Order of the Garter. And the Order of the Garter began in 1344. Okay? So we're pretty sure, at the very least, that Shagan of the Green Knight comes after that. Well, and these are kind of loose dates, that is, it wasn't, you know, January 1st, 1350, somebody said, hey, let's start the alliterative revival today and get a group and generally 1350 to 1375, right? Now, Sir Gallon of the Green Knight is not a poem written in London. It's not a poem written anywhere near London. So if you've ever read, for example, Chaucer in Middle English, okay, you can make your way through Chaucer as a modern English speaker and reader. There'll be parts where you'll have difficulty with. Okay? So Gallon and the Green Knight is almost impossible unless you've studied the Middle English language because it's so much different from modern English. And the reason it's so much different from modern English, go back to your map on page 821. The reason it's so much different from modern English is because Sir Gallon of the Green Knight hails from, let's see, right up here, right around the city of Chester, or the town of Chester. Right? Chester's way up here in the northeast, northwest Midlands. London's down here in the southeast. Okay? Sorry, London's down here in the southeast. In other words, the language of Sir Gowan and the Green Knight is very far out in the provinces. Further away you get from London, all right, the more archaic the language is. And it's the more um, how do I put this? In in some senses. The closer you get to kind of older Anglo-Saxon forms, okay, and fewer later Middle English developments, right? Even though we're going to see in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, we, there is some influence of French, but not as much. Okay? So the language is much more difficult to understand. Now, J.R.R. Tolkien, in an edition he did in the 1920s, of Sir Gallon and the Green Knight. He was the one who located it to within, and he did this on the basis of merely studying the language, the sounds of the language. All right? 
He located it to within, if I remember right, about a 20 mile radius of the city of Chester, the town of Chester. Tolkien was a phenomenal philologist, that is, person who studies language, lexicon, phonology, grammar, structure, syntax, that kind of stuff. Okay. And he did a bunch of word studies and was able to determine that within about 20 miles of Chester is where Sir Gowan and the Green Knight um, originated. Okay. A couple other background things. What we see, let me erase all this, what we see in Sir Gowan and the Green Knight are a weaving together of three pretty important folktale or, well, I'll call them folktale. Folktale Celtic elements. And one, which we see right at the beginning, is that you have a beheading game. You know, kind of like medieval Russian roulette. <laughs> well, this will be fun. I'll take a swing. No, no, okay. You take a swing, and if you don't kill me, then I'll take a swing at you. Okay? Pull out the battle axes and have a whack, in other words. Okay? Two, okay, we have a temptation scene or game. Okay. And three, an exchange of winnings. And your introduction is going to talk about the feast of Recrew, B-R-I-C-R-I-U, which is a Celtic tale, okay, that Sir Gowan and the Green Knight probably is based upon. The Feast of Recrew does not have all of this, though, okay. Sir Gowan and the Green Knight is obviously Arthurian. Why? Because it has Sir Gowan in it. And Sir Gowan is a knight of Arthur's table. We are going to see Arthur even at the beginning. Okay, so that's all kind of background. What we're going to see is we're going to see these three things get woven together. And okay? these three themes or threads, if you want, will get woven together within the course of the poem. So notice how it begins. It begins at Troy. Like the Iliad Troy. The fall of the Trojan War, Troy. Okay, why? Because it's part of British popular, well, not popular today. In the Middle Ages, it was popular. British popular mythology was that the Britons, B R I T O N S, were descended from Aeneas, the son of Priam, king of Troy, Hector's brother. Okay. When the Greeks destroyed Troy and Aeneas escaped, first Aeneas goes to Carthage where he hooks up with Dido and gets her all in love with him and then she kills herself because he won't marry her. And then he goes off to Rome. Okay. And then the Trojans make their way and found Britain. All right. Through, not Aeneas directly, Brutus. Well, look. Brute. Brit, we're pretty close. Okay. And you do have a poem written in um, early Middle English titled just The Brute. Okay. So Brutus is a Trojan? About Brutus, yes. Well, he's a descendant of Trojans. So they're related to Trojans? Yeah. Brutus is, you know, Aeneas would be like back here, and then his father, Priam, would be back here. And there's a few generations in there. So, we find out that the English are related, or the Brits are related to Aeneas and Brutus and stuff. All right? But where we want to pick up is about line 37. What time of year is it? It's Christmas. What's Arthur doing? Yeah, it's Christmas. What do you got? You have a party. Okay? 
So the king spends Christmas at Camelot. Noble brothers in arms were at the table. And what do they do? They fight, they joust, all this kind of stuff. And we get long descriptions of them. Okay? We're going to talk, not today, we'll, we'll do it on third Tuesday. We'll talk about who the possible audience is of this poem. But notice they spend the 12 days of Christmas, essentially, partying and jousting and fighting. The new year has come, right, line 60. Guinevere is dressed gaily, we're told, line 74, seated on the upper level. That is, she's up on the dais so everybody can see her and all this kind of stuff. French fabric underfoot. Notice the anachronism there. Because if you understand when Arthur should have lived, there weren't any French in AD. Okay, they were just vulgar Romans, let's call them. All right? So she's there, and many men are looking at her and stuff. And Sir Gowan is seated beside Guinevere, line 147. The king's holding his feast. We have a bishop and all this kind of stuff. Um, they've got kettle drums going off. Let's see here. Da, 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 da. I'm going to pick up. And we're told... Hold on, I skipped the line I wanted to. Um, back to line... 123. Arthur would not eat until everyone was served. He was so lively in his youth and a little boyish. He would also never eat, line 130, on such a special day until he'd been told a curious tale about some perilous thing. Great wonder that he could believe of princes of battles or other marvels. Line. I was afraid of something. No, the other 130. Look on the other page. No, same page. Turn to the net. Is yours not <laughs> are yours not numbered 130 on both pages? On 262 and 263? No. 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 So, see, some of you have same printings I do where they screwed up. Um, yeah, the one is 85. Arthur would not eat until everyone was served, and then around 91, he would never eat on such a special day, etc. So we have, in, in my book, it's... It's in order on the left side. Yeah, on the, on the old, uh, the Middle English is in order. The right and English, it's all messed up. It's like that throughout the book, by the way. Um, the point I'm wanting to emphasize is two things can... Or Arthur will eat. Okay? One, everybody has to be served. Okay? And two, Arthur either, so, one, everybody served. Let's get that courtesy and manners. And two, has a two part component to it, A and B. One, either he tail of some marvel or some wonder or some mysterious thing or some great battle or he sees a marvel or he sees something wondrous. Okay? Okay, we'll stop there since it's 925 and we'll pick up at whatever line that is. Um, actually, we're going to pick up with when the Green Knight comes in on line 130 on page 263. Make sure we have that same numbering.